Bang ding ding, trademark. Ah, he come out six foot seven tall. Bang ding ding, one is tall. <laughs> Welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is founder and cybersecurity expert at Dion Training, Jason Dion. At Dion Training, they offer a path to IT and cybersecurity certification through in-depth, actionable training that gives students the real-world education they need to be able to meet today's cybersecurity challenges. Jason is not only the principal at Dion Training, but also an instructor at Liberty University's College of Engineering and Computational Science and holds a broad range of informational technology certifications. Here to discuss the current state of cybersecurity, how to get started in an IT career, and the role of digital disruption in our economy. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Jason Dion. How are you, Jason? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. We're thrilled too. Um, I guess, uh, you know, this, this conversation I think is going to be really exciting. I know that this is a topic that Mike has particular interest in. And uh, I believe, Mike, if you want to maybe give us a little background, but I think you were taking Jason's course and that's how you came to know him. Uh, yeah, I um, I was trying to learn a little bit about uh, cybersecurity and the IT world. And um, one of the recommendations I got was I should study Linux. And so I jumped on to LinkedIn Learning and took a, a Linux class, and it was actually one of Jason's. And so I reached out to see if he would be interested in being a guest on our show. And sure enough, here he is. Um, Jason, do you want to give us a little background about yourself, how you got into cybersecurity and, um, you know, just a little bit about your, your career in the, in the IT industry? Sure. Uh, I've been doing IT and cybersecurity for a little over 20 years now. Uh, when I got out of high school, I was going to college for computer science. Um, I programmed in about 15 languages, love programming, love computers, always just kind of be that nerdy, geeky kind of guy. Uh, and I started my own company doing website design, programming, and some penetration testing back then. Um, after 9-11, I decided to sell my company, and I ended up joining the military. And I worked with the military and the government for a long time, uh, gaining additional skill in cybersecurity. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I decided to start teaching at a college. I started with a community college, then moved to University of Maryland and Liberty University, uh, teaching specifically cybersecurity. Uh, I have a master's degree in IT and, and information assurance. Uh, and then I started teaching online and, and it kind of moved from online in the college realm into online by video through YouTube and then Udemy and then LinkedIn Learning into our own company. Uh, and now we have a small company. We've got about 10 of us on the team. Uh, and we have helped over 300,000 students get their IT certifications so far in the last four years. So small companies done a lot of great things and reached a lot of people. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, that's a lot of people whose lives you've been, been able to influence uh, just by putting your content out there. So that's really cool. Um, I also like that uh, you went from a programming background into an IT field uh, after 9-11 and, and joined the military. Did did you have an IT, like a desire to get into it uh, back then? Or was 9-11 kind of like what spurred it for you to switch over? So actually the funny thing is I was doing IT before I joined the military. So uh, before joining the military, I had my own company doing website design and programming. We did penetration testing and network design specifically for small and medium-sized businesses out in Florida. Uh, once 9-11 happened, uh, I decided to sell my company and join the military. And I actually joined the Navy as a nuclear reactor operator. Uh, okay. So I, I, joined, I enlisted in the Navy. I went through training with them and kind of took a detour away from IT for several years. 
Uh, and then later on, I switched from the enlisted side to the officer side. And when I did that, uh, I got back into the IT side. Uh, and so that's when I really started doing a lot more of the cybersecurity at the larger organizational level. Nice. Yeah, no, I love that. Well, and that's a, a really cool story. Thank you for your service. Um, hey, do you mind, can you, let's take like maybe half a step back or at least sort of set the terms of our conversation just in that, I think cybersecurity and words like that get bandied around a lot. Oh, do yes. you mind kind of breaking down what it is we're talking about? Because I mean, when we hear it from our local news guy, like it almost never is actually what we're talking about. <laughs> so do you mind breaking down what we're talking about when, when we mean yeah. cybersecurity and when we're having this kind of discussion? Yeah, I think that's really important as well, because that's one of the questions I usually get. Uh, usually the first question I ask a student, they say, I want to get in cybersecurity. So, you know, if Ryan called me up and said, hey, I'm interested in cybersecurity, what class should I take? The first thing I'll say is, well, what do you mean by cybersecurity? What is it you want to do? Because cybersecurity is such a broad term these days. Um, and the funny thing is it's kind of evolved over the last 20 years. It used to be you were an IT person, information technology. Then there was the IT that was operational, where you actually ran the network. And then there was information assurance where you're focused on the security of the network. Over time, it moved from information assurance into cybersecurity. And generally, when you hear cybersecurity, you're hearing people use that term when they're talking about people who do ethical hacking. So you're trying to break into companies uh, to be able to find weaknesses in their network. Uh, you'll hear that when people are doing it as a defensive side, where you are looking through logs and trying to catch the bad guys who have broken into your network. And that's kind of the traditional cybersecurity. Um, there, there's a lot of other places that will throw that term around and even some places that will include the operations side, the typical system administrator, network administrator who runs a network, and they'll lump that into cybersecurity too, even though traditionally it's not nearly as, as clean cut into the cybersecurity realm. It's more of the operations side and then the defense side. So I think that's kind of where the clear uh, de delineation is between those. When we talk yeah. about cybersecurity, it's really focused on how you can better defend your network to protect yourself from hackers and bad guys and bad people and people who try to do harm to your organization. And there's lots of ways they can do that. Um, and, you know, traditionally when people say cybersecurity, they always think I want to be a hacker, right? Because that's kind of the cool thing. Uh, and that is one piece of cybersecurity, but it is only one small piece of the larger picture. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Also, just while we're talking about it, do you mind sort of establishing what it is we're talking about when we talk about a hacker? I think, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because it happened the other day to my wife and, and I always get kind of a, a chuckle out of it, but you know, something will go awry. There'll be a, a virus or something on there uh, on a computer or on a machine, or, or maybe it's a piece of malware or something. And, uh, the inclination of most people is to freak out and assume they've been hacked as if there's some guy sitting in some Eastern European country somewhere who's, you know, personally made it their mission to, you know, interrupt what you're watching on your Nintendo switch or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and I think, and I think it's, uh, it may be important for people to understand what we're actually talking about with hacking. You know, there may be such a thing as the individual who is breaking into, you know, uh, breaking firewalls or, or doing whatever, you know, a la Hollywood. But I think that there are also, you know, these maybe larger robotic, attacks or sort of pre-programmed attacks that are going out there that feel like you're being hacked, but it's not really what you think. Yeah. So that's a great distinction, right? Uh, you know, as we watch movies and you always see, you know, the, the typical hacker, they grab the keyboard, they type four or five commands and woo, I broke through the firewall. Uh, it doesn't really work that way, right? It takes a lot more time. Uh, when you are trying to be a hacker and break into somebody's network, 90% of your attack is research and development and figuring out the ways in, lining up all the holes so that you can write that execute that execution and be able to hack in. Generally, what we see is a lot more of the, the, um, the widespread attacks, similar to what you're saying, right? It's, it's AI, it's artificial intelligence, or it's machine learning based. It's a bot that's going around the internet and it's testing every single computer it finds to see if it has a hole. And if it has that hole, then it goes, oh, I see hole A, that means I need to use exploit B. And they can just pair those up and then break into your machine that way. When you look at things like ransomware, that's generally how it happens to most people. Your computer's online, and if you're running a Windows 10 machine, it has a certain operating system version. If you're running um, you know, some piece of software on there, for instance, you're using the Edge browser or the Chrome browser, that has a particular version. And hackers can look out there and find out that there's a bug, there's a vulnerability. And so they'll make an exploit that attacks that bug or vulnerability. And so when they see that you're running you know, Windows 10 version 123, they know that that's vulnerable. They will then say, ah, I found somebody who's running that thing. Let me go and throw this exploit at it. And that's the way they get into your computer. And then with ransomware, they then the thing they're delivering is the ability to encrypt your hard drive so that you can't get access to your files anymore. And then you'll pay them money to get your files back. 
And, and so really, it's not that they targeted you. Uh, they're targeting every computer on the internet because they're just going around and they're just going across like, okay, when can I find one that is, you know, Windows 10 version 123, found one, let me go and run this exploit on it. And it's, it's almost like a phishing campaign, but you're just doing it methodically from computer to computer all the way across the network. Huh. And yeah, no, uh, I think that's really useful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for breaking that down for us. Um, as someone who is interested in possibly getting into this field, there's so many cert certifications and so many different routes and paths you can go down. Uh, can you give like an introductory course or an introductory uh, path for someone who might be interested in, in pursuing this field? What is military the best option? Do you think that that would be the, the smartest route to get in and get your feet wet or taking your programs and your classes online. Uh, one thing I like about your website over others that I've seen is you actually break it down into IT or cybersecurity, and then you have a full path that you use from, and then you go from there, which is really, really neat. Cause I've been down the route trying to learn how to, you know, program and do different things. And I just jump into a language, not knowing what I want and waste six months trying to learn one thing. And then I don't even know HTML or CSS or layout, the things that you really should learn first. So I like that you break it down in a, in a, in a path, but as someone who's getting started, what would you recommend someone do? Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, great uh, question. Uh, so one of the things that I learned early in my career is I had a mentor who told me you should always be thinking five years ahead. Uh, and his point in that was, you're not thinking about the job you're in today. It's where do you want to be in five years? Because based on that, you can figure out how you're going to get there. Because to get that job that you want in five years, you probably have to have one or two jobs leading up to that to get to that skill set or a couple of certifications or a degree or something of that nature. So generally, when I have a new student who comes to me and they say, hey, I want to be in cybersecurity, my first question is, well, what in cybersecurity do you want to do? And one of the best places to go for that is there's a website called cyberseek.org. Uh, cyber, C-Y-B-E-R, seek, S-E-E-K, dot O-R-G. And it's a nonprofit site run by CompTIA and a bunch of others. And they actually have a little chart called the pathway. And you can click on that and say, I want to be a penetration tester, for instance. And it'll say, well, if you're going to be a penetration tester, normally the path is you come in through this route, this route, or this route. And then you click there and it'll tell you to get to that route. You know, you keep moving left until you get to the entry level jobs. And so it'll take you from the beginning entry level jobs up to the advanced jobs. And that really is your five to 10 year plan. Uh, for instance, let's say you want to be a penetration tester, the guy who sits there and hacks corporate networks and tries to break in to find all those issues. Um, to have that skill set, it's not an entry level job. To be a penetration tester, you have to understand networks. You have to understand operating systems. You have to understand a little bit of coding and scripting. Uh, you need to understand security. And you need to understand how these things are designed to work on the administration side and the operation side so you can find the flaws and break into them. And so that's one of the, I think, the biggest misconceptions inside cybersecurity is a lot of people say, you'll see all these newspaper uh, newspaper articles, they'll say there are, you know, 21 million jobs that are open for this type of thing, or there's, you know, 3 million empty jobs in cybersecurity in 2021 was the last one I had seen. Um, and the problem is those aren't entry-level jobs, even though they're entry-level in cybersecurity, because being entry-level in cybersecurity means you already have two or three years of experience in IT operations. Because if you've never been a system administrator and you try to be a pen tester, you're going to fail because you don't understand those things. You don't understand what the good guys are doing to try to protect it. And if you understand what the good guys are doing, you can then figure out how to exploit those things. Um, and that's really, it's kind of the, uh, you know, we call it blue team, red team, blue team defense, red team attack. Um, and it's hard to be red team if you've never been blue team. If you've never defended, it's hard to attack and find your way through. Um, I like to equate it, you know, the, uh, if you think about your house, right? Let's say your house right now, as you're sitting there, you want to make sure that nobody can break into your house. Well, you're going to go around, you're going to lock all your doors, you're going to lock all your windows. But if you just leave one of those windows open, the burglar, as they go around your house, is going to check every door and window until they find that one open window. And that's how they're going to get in. And it's the same thing with attackers. Unless you are 100% locked down, somebody is going to find a way in. And the problem is in cyber and in IT, we can never be 100% locked down. Because the only way to 100% lock down your computer is to take it off the internet and be offline. And if you're online on the internet, there's always going to be a way into your computer. I know that sounds scary, but it's just true. There's always going to be a way in. So we try to layer up the fences. We try to find ways to block things. Um, so maybe if you have your window open, you have a gate around your property and that gate is locked. So that helps prevent people from getting to the house to be able to open the window. And so you have to start layering your defenses to be able to protect from those. Um, you know, going back to your question, as far as, you know, the, the traditional pathway, um, the first three things that most people start out with is the A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+, plus certifications. These are certifications from CompTIA. Uh, A+, plus is hardware and software. 
So you're learning how does Windows work? How does Linux work? How does Mac work? How does hardware work? Like what does a hard drive do versus RAM versus um, you know, the motherboard versus the graphics card? All of that type of stuff at the individual workstation level. Then the next one is network plus. And that starts talking about routers and switches and how we connect things inside our houses and out to the internet at large. Because most of what we do as an attacker is focused on network exploitation. Because most people aren't going to be in your office trying to break into your computers. They're coming from over the internet. And so if you don't understand how networks work, you're not going to be able to defend against that. And then the third layer is security. And that's kind of the entry-level cybersecurity certification. But like I said, just to get to that entry-level cybersecurity, you already kind of need to know the hardware, software, and networks to understand that. And that's security clause. It focuses on the domain environment, which is multiple computers in a small or medium-sized office. Um, and the different ways that we can use things like encryption, patching, uh, understanding all the different threats and vulnerabilities like ransomware versus viruses versus worms, and understanding how all that works so you can help defend against it. So that's kind so, of the, the first place to start. We call that the Compia trifecta. I like that. Um, so as someone who might be just trying to get started in this, what's an actual kind of uh, uh, a realistic estimate, estimate as to how long it would take to complete these certifications and possibly get into an entry level position. I I know that you got these the the super smart people out there that have a great knowledge and can just jump in and learn it real quick versus an average person. Is it a five year period? Is it a six year period, a two year period? Oh, no. What no 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 definitely not that long. Yeah. So the great thing about IT and cybersecurity in general is that it's not necessarily that you need to have a four year college degree to get into this, right? Um, generally, the things that we look for are experiences first and foremost, secondary certifications, and then third is degrees. So let's talk about the certifications for a moment here, because that, that goes directly to your question. When I talk about something like the A+, um, most students will do that within one to two months, um, basically between watching videos, uh, reading a textbook, studying and taking the exam. It usually takes about a month, two months, if you're doing it part-time in your nights and weekends because you have a regular job. If you go to a boot camp environment where you just do it, hey, I'm doing nothing but this for the next week or two, most students can do that within one to two weeks and knock that certification out. Um, and that's a two-part certification for um, A+. It's the hardware and the software, so it's two different tests. And you got to pass both of those to become A-plus certified. Uh, the second level is Network Plus. Normally, that's about 40 hours worth of effort, so it's about a week. Um, if you're doing it full-time, if you're doing it nights and weekends, again, about a month. Um, and then Security Plus, the same. It's about a week of effort or a month if you're doing it part-time. Um, most of my, in my programs, we have what we call the 60 day pass guarantee. So when somebody signs up for our course, we give them 60 days to complete the course and take their certification. Um, and that's to help force them into doing this very quickly instead of dragging it out over months. And by doing that, uh, if they don't pass their exam after that 60 day guarantee on our site, we actually buy their retake voucher uh, because some of these certifications can get pretty expensive. Um, most of these certifications cost between 300 and up to $1,200 to take. The wow. CompTIA ones are about $300, $350. Um, so a lot of students are worried, you know, hey, if I take this and I fail, uh, I got to pay another $350 to take it again. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we try to do is stand behind our products to help people over that hurdle. Um, but yeah, so so it, it's not that it takes a long time to get the certifications, um, but you do have to put forth the effort and you have to take the time to study it. Uh, and then as far as, you know, getting into the career, you know, this, the biggest piece is experience. And this is one of the reasons why people have a lot of trouble getting a, their first cybersecurity job because employers are looking for somebody who has experience. And so if you come in and you have zero experience in IT, you've never been a system administrator, you've never been a network admin, you got you know, three or four certifications and you apply for a job, most employers aren't going to hire you because you have zero experience and they want somebody who is known and proven. And that's one of the reasons that's leading to this big gap in the cybersecurity workforce between a lot of jobs are available and not a lot of people are getting hired for those jobs because the employers want that perfect unicorn who has lots of experience, lots of certifications, and is ready to just you know take them from company A, put them in company B, and they can go right to work. Um, and a lot of students are reluctant to start out on the operations side because they keep hearing about how cybersecurity is this awesome career field that makes all this money. So everybody wants to start on that side of the business. But to get to that side of the business, the easiest path is to come in through the operations side. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I saw this uh, meme on LinkedIn earlier today. It was this uh, toddler reading the HTML programming yep. thing, and it and it was like when 
when they expect 10 years of experience from a 20 year old, <laughs> it, was, it was just like, you know, it's like funny because there actually are things like that. Like I was looking at one job post a couple of years ago and it said, must have 10 years of go language experience. Those a programming language made by Google. Yeah. The language was only three years old. <laughs> Nobody has 10 years of experience, right? Even Google didn't create it 10 years ago. So sometimes there's a disconnect between what employers are asking for and what really is reality. Um, and when it comes to that, it's one of the things I tell students is don't be scared off based on what they're asking for. Still apply for the job because if they're asking for something stupid like that, 10 years of experience with a language that's been around for three years, they're never going to find anybody. So at least if you apply, you may get it because you have two or three years of experience. Um, so, so there is some of that that happens. And that's because there's a disconnect between the way hiring works in the cybersecurity world and, and what reality is. Um, hiring is done by HR folks. HR folks are not cybersecurity professionals. They have no idea what a CISSP is or a CEH or a Security Plus. They just know that somebody said, hey, I need somebody to fill this job and I want to pay them X amount of dollars, uh, you know, is what we're budgeted for this. And they go, oh, well, if it's going to be $100,000, that person should have an equivalent of 10 years of experience and they should have XYZ certifications and maybe a four-year bachelor's degree. And so they'll put that as a requirement, even though that really has nothing to do with the job you're going to do. Um, and that's why experience trumps everything else. Um, and they go from experience to certifications to degrees in that order. Because if you have experience, you're in the door. If you don't, you can supplement that by using those certifications. And then usually the degrees are just to help establish what your pay band is going to be when you get that job. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, it, you see it a lot, especially in technical careers, but also I see it sort of in the advertising and marketing side or on the creative side anyway, yeah. um, where, you know, the the weight to put on a college degree is actually almost the last thing you need. You know, I mean, that that might show some perseverance or some whatever, but I think it's it's really important to, uh, to understand, I guess, you, your specific career. And if you're going to go into a technical career, you may not need to be pushing for that, you know, six years of education as much as you need to just get that entry level job. So, I think it's important to talk about that, but maybe that also opens the door to a conversation about sort of alternative paths to education. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting that you, uh, as somebody who began life as a programmer and all, and you know, sort of worked your way through the computer systems that way. Um, I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong for being stereotypical, but generally speaking, those aren't the people who then want to go out in front of people and share their message, right? And, uh, and maybe you picked that up in the military, or maybe you've always been, you know, drawn to uh, open discussion and trying to teach. But, uh, but I think that there's something to that where now we have all these different alternatives to education outside of just traditional college. And oh, so yeah. I wondered if you wouldn't talk about that a little bit and just sort of, you know, the role that Dion training plays in that, but also, you know, online training for all kinds of things versus, you know, a traditional college experience. Yes, this is something I've actually talked a lot about in the last couple of years when I do live streams or other podcasts, um, because I do have a very unique perspective in this, because I, I started college, uh, you know, back in 1999 when I graduated high school, and I went to go get a computer science degree because, you know, back in the 80s, we were all taught, you know, you have to go to college to go get a good job. So off I went to go get a, a college degree. And my first two years of college, I literally only got to take one computer class because everything else was English and science and, and math, and it had nothing to do with what I wanted to be. And it, it made it so that I went from being, you know, top of my class in, in high school to not doing very well in, in college because I just didn't have the interest for it because I wanted to do computers. I didn't want to do all this other philosophy and sociology and all the other stuff. Um, and there's a place for that, I think, in some degree fields, but in computers, it, it, for me, I think it, it's kind of a, a struggle there. Um, you know, fast forward 20 years, I then became a college professor, right? So it's kind of the complete opposite. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, one thing no, I like about. <laughs> it's, it's funny, you know, and that's also sort of my experience. You know, I, I, I think we're probably kind of contemporary on age. And, yep. uh, you know, that was sort of my thing, too, is I, you know, was I ran into college right after school or right after I got out of high school anyway. And I did a couple of years and I was doing the same thing. I had gone into school to be an architect, however. And so but same thing. Right. Here I am taking all these, uh, you know, uh, psychology courses and English and math and all this stuff. But all I wanted to really do was sit and do my my CAD engineering or whatever. And I came from an interesting background in that my uh, high school had a, an incredible architecture program. So we were working on CAD. We were creating our own blueprints. We were doing everything like you would run in a full-blown architecture shop. And then I got to the university and we were back to hand drawing everything. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and it was a massive step backwards, right? So I, like you, sort of checked out and this, this isn't what I want to do. And uh, I even tried one year of vocational school. 
And I will say that that one year of vocational school, which is more for people don't, who don't know, that's really more like a hands-on training versus sort of an academic style school. That one year of vocational school, like check the boxes for me. I love that. Oh, yeah. And uh, and so, but it, to your point, it's more hyper-focused training, right? So fast forward 20 years, and now we've got a plethora, you know, basically, you know, you, you can take Harvard classes for free over, you know, your uh, iPod. So it's, uh, you know, now you can, the, or the opportunities or the options available to us are so much greater, and you can really focus in, right, exactly on what it is you're trying to learn. Yeah, and I think the big thing, the big challenge that I've, the big change I've seen over the past 20 years, especially in the IT and cybersecurity industry, was when I first started getting involved right out of high school in 99, 2000, um, you can go out and just get a certification, go to a three-month class that teaches Microsoft or some of these CompTIA certifications, like what Dion Training does, get those certifications, you know, and because nobody was certified, it really helped you stand out. You could jump right and do a good job. Over time, as more people did that, uh, it became supply and demand, right? If there's a large supply of people who have those certifications, what ends up happening is you end up having the prices go down on labor. And so what one of the things that started happening was they started saying, well, now that we have so many people who are certified, um, and maybe there's a lot of people who are starting to get certifications that weren't necessarily qualified. Uh, I've seen some of that too through cheating in other ways. And so people start saying, well, now we want the college degree again. And so from about 2008 to 2015 or so, college degree became paramount again. Um, and I think a lot of that was because of the recession we had back in 2008 uh, with the housing crisis. A lot of people who had college degrees were now available at a lower price. So companies said, well, hey, if I can get somebody with a college degree for less money, why not? And so they started going that route. Um, now, as we get closer to you know, 2020s, 2021, 2022, um, that is starting to go away again because there's been this backlash of why do I need a $100,000 college degree to go be a guy who runs your computer network? You yeah. don't, right? You may need that if you're going to be the IT director in charge of budgets and management and all these people. But if you're the guy who's running the servers, you probably don't need that. You just need the technical knowledge to do that. And so now we're seeing a resurgence back towards certifications. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is there's this backlash against college and the expense of it that's holding people out of the job market. The other thing is when, when you go to college, the classes you learn tend to be old and outdated. Uh, when I went to college, we were learning a language called Pascal, which at the time was already outdated. And now it's like completely dead. Nobody uses that. Um, but that's what happens with college curriculums. It takes a lot longer for them to update. Whereas with certifications, we update our curriculum every three years at a minimum, if not more often. Uh, because the chest changes every three years. Whereas in college, I know when I taught in college, I taught at the same college for five years, we use the exact same textbook for five years. And you can't tell me that in five years, computers didn't change, right? Because they definitely yeah. did. Um, well, yeah, no, it's of, funny. It's funny because like right now, you know, 2021, I, I've gone back to university to try and finish my degree that I abandoned earlier in life. Um, you know, just to sort of complete the the story of education. And, uh, you know, basically I left school initially because I was doing so well as a freelancer and as a graphic designer that I, I didn't have time for school too. So I just got right into my career and, you know, now I'm interested in maybe a career pivot. I'm looking at maybe an MBA or some other things like that, but I need to go ahead and wrap up this degree I started in order to do that. Right. And I only had like 18 credits left or something. So, so I'm uh, so now I'm enrolled back in school. And to your point, I, I mean, you can ask Mike cause he and I complain after the shows <laughs> about all our personal <laughs> issues and, uh, and one of the things that I've been griping about ad nauseum lately is just the age of the curriculum that I'm learning right now. And, and yeah. my stuff is like business leadership. So I imagine there's some fundamental things and stuff in there. But I was joking last week about this article that I had to read that was citing this up and coming CEO, the founder of Next Computers, to Steve Jobs. You know, and it was like, OK, not only is he long dead, but that company is long dead. You know, he's, I mean, like, you know, but here's this young up, or, up and comer, this whippersnapper, Steve Jobs, you know, what if he ever becomes something? And, uh, you know, so it's just kind of funny that that's the curriculum. And, and I'm taking another one that's a, an earth science class, but the text is from 1996. So you're yep. telling me nothing has changed in the field of earth science since 1996? <laughs> like, I mean, it's bonkers. And, and so I think to your point, you know, it's the bureaucracy of the academic system or of the sort of the university system that just it requires a lot of time and takes a lot of you know, budgetary concerns and time concerns and, and all these different issues to make change. And so they're not very, you know, they're not capable of quick pivoting and staying up, uh, caught up to whatever the latest greatest is, where in your certification training and also just in other methodologies of online education, you know, they can build you a course this week about whatever the new thing is. And so, uh, so we're much more agile, I guess, in this new environment versus sort of a traditional education. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, 
for, for our company, you know, if we go to build a course, for instance, it usually takes us about three months to write the course, film the course, edit the course, and put it out. If we're going to do it live, I can write it this week and, and have it live this weekend uh, with students if there's something that's that pressing and, and urgent. Um, but when you try to do something through like a textbook cycle, it takes them nine months just to get the thing from the time they submit to the publisher to get it edited, published, on the shelf, starting to ship. And so it's already old by the time it gets out. And then you now have the colleges who have to adopt that textbook, get it into their book system, get it into their curriculum, which means, oh, well, we'll do that in the fall of next year. So now it's already 18 months behind before the first student ever gets that. And so it is world. I know when I was going for my master's degree, um, the, the stuff we were learning had nothing to do with cloud computing at all. And yet cloud computing was the thing that was taking over the world, you know, from 2010 to 2000, uh, from 2010 to 2020, right? And it was not mentioned at all. It wasn't even a concept cover because it was none, none of the textbooks yet. Uh, sorry, I think I cut you off, Mike. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was actually going to ask about uh, how you got into Dion training. Like, why, why did you uh, decide I'm going to start making these classes and uh, what what spawned that? And then how can you tell us about the process of the first year or so of trying to get it up and going? Um, I'm sure that had to be a, an interesting, you know, process to get your videos out there and then and get the training started. So, yeah, so um, I started teaching at uh, the community college. Um, so I was getting towards the end of my career with the government. And I was thinking, hey, what do I want to do for my next act, right? Because, you know, generally in the military or, or the government, you work for, you know, 20, 30 years, and then you retire and go do something else because you're still rather young. Um, and so I was like, well, what do I want to do next? And I really always enjoyed teaching people. Uh, in the military early on, I was a nuclear power instructor for a while. So I was teaching people how to run nuclear power plants, and I really enjoyed teaching. Um, and, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, most of my military time and government time, was working with um, IT stuff. And so I've done a lot of these certifications and uh, I started teaching at the community college. And the way I got in was they need people who could teach certifications because a lot of the uh, undergraduate courses now are aligned to the certifications. So I started teaching the A plus, the net plus and the security plus, which was aligned to four of their different courses. And they hired me on as a professor, as an adjunct professor to do that. Um, so I started teaching with them. And then in my, my day job with the government, I started traveling a lot. And so I couldn't be in school anymore because I used to teach nights and weekends for the community college. And so for one of my last classes, I recorded it. Uh, and you know, it was just my voice with a microphone over my PowerPoint slides I would use in class. And I put them up on YouTube. Um, and I think they're actually still on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> my old A plus, you know, 8001, 8002 8, series, which was uh, 2016, 17, 18, somewhere around there. So it's pretty old at this point. Um, but yeah, so I, I put it up on YouTube and I'm like, hey, you know, I'll see if I can make it go with this. Maybe I'll just create these things and kind of do the professor investor model where he gives away the videos. And then, um, you know, he, he lives off of the ad revenue and he also sells a textbook to go with it. So I started doing that. And um, one of my friends at work was like, hey, have you heard of this thing called Udemy? Uh, and I'd never heard of it before, but it's like LinkedIn Learning. It's another one of those online course learning platforms. He's like, yeah, you should take your stuff and put it on there and you can sell it. And, you know, maybe you can make it, make that into you know, make some money. And so I was like, okay, I'll try that. So I took that and it's a much better environment than YouTube because YouTube has videos, but it doesn't have the ability to do quizzes, download PDFs or any of that kind of stuff you need for certifications. So I took my videos and I turned them into a course on Udemy to test it out. And the first month I made a whole $58. And honestly, <laughs> I was like super excited. because I was like, that was more than I had made on YouTube at that point, right? Because YouTube ad revenue is not that much. Um, and so I, I was kind of like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then the next month it doubled and it made like 160. The next month was like 250. And so I kept adding new courses and kind of built it up from there. But I started out primarily on Udemy. Uh, and my thought was, um, hey, I can help a lot more people this way uh, because they have millions and millions of students out there. Um, and it can help cover the cost of building these things because to make this, you have to have cameras, you have to have video editing software, or you have to pay somebody to edit your stuff. You have to pay to get it captioned so that uh, just like when you do with a podcast, if you go and get it captioned after it's you know, $2 a minute to get it captioned or stuff like that. And so I started charging for these and uh, Udemy is a very low cost platform. Generally, it'll cost you 10 to $20 for a course. So it's less than going and buying a textbook and you're getting a full video course that replaces the textbook. Um, and so I started there and it just kind of started taking off. And now four years later, we've got, you know, 250, 270,000 people on Udemy. Um, so lots and lots of students there. And that kind of got me into LinkedIn Learning, uh, which is where you found me. Um, and then we started selling stuff on our own site as well. Um, and really where we started doing that was because Udemy is limited in what you can do. It's pretty much videos, quizzes, and PDFs only. 
Um, and one of the components that we like to have is more of a hands-on learning approach uh, where you can actually go through and do labs. So in our, our CompTIA courses, they all come with hands-on labs. So when you go into it and you're learning about routers and switches, it'll actually put you in an environment and you'll log into a router or switch and you'll do configurations on it. You'll make sure that you're actually routing the traffic. You'll make sure you'll see how the packets are flowing. And so you get a, a much more hands-on, on-the-job training style with those labs. And Udemy doesn't support that. So on our site, we include that part, whereas on Udemy, it's just the videos. Um, and so it's it's very similar between the two, except we had that hands-on lab on our side. Um, that's kind of how we kind of grew it. It really wasn't a forethought that I was going to create Dion training. Uh, it was one of those things that uh, it was, it was it originally my first website was jasondion.com. It was just my name because uh, I was just an, you know, an online teacher with Udemy. Um, and as we started getting more popular and had more students, um, I hired on some employees. And as I started hiring employees, it kind of felt weird to have them working for jasondion.com. Uh, <laughs> so we created Dion training. Uh, and the reason we did Dion training is because we thought, hey, a, a niche, uh, w around jasondion.com, it was Jason's the only instructor. And the thought was, hey, maybe one day we'll get other instructors to work with us. And we'll put out courses with either co-instructors or they would do those courses because I can only teach so many things myself because uh, it takes three to six months to make a course. Um, so I have about 30 courses, but that's about as many as I can make uh, because every three, four years I have to redo the courses because things change. And so I have students all the time say, hey, are you ever going to teach AWS? Because Amazon Web Services is really big in cloud. It's like, I'd love to, but I just don't have the time. Uh, and so we always thought, hey, maybe we'll get some additional people one day. Um, we haven't done that yet. We've done it a couple of times, but it hadn't really worked out so well because um, my students tend to get used to my way of teaching and they didn't really like the other instructor we had hired. Uh, so we're, we're still going back and forth on whether we're going to stay where we are or continue to expand further. I love that. Well, thanks so much for for breaking that down. I think it's uh it's really interesting, and you know, like we were talking about, this sort of this new world of alternative education. I think uh, you know to sort of hear, you know, I mean, you know, you're a guy who who developed some reputation, but it's not like you're an Instagram influencer or something, right? You're just a guy that knows something, and you came out there and you started to to pitch it. So, you know, you weren't like relying on some kind of fame or something to build an audience. You actually built a loyal crowd from the beginning. So, I think that's really useful to share. Yeah, that's really, that's really where it came from, right? So it's, uh, you know, every student who took our course and then passed their exam, they then tell other people, oh, hey, I passed using this thing. You should go use that too. Uh, just, like, just like Mike had said, he was looking for a Linux course and somebody said, oh, you should check out Jason's course because uh, there was some other student who told him that that liked it. And so that's how, you know, he found it. Uh, or, you know, he found us on LinkedIn Learning, which is another one of our platforms. So he was searching for the content of Linux and then he found us through that. Uh, and so we find a lot of that is, is how it goes. We have not done marketing in our company uh, this is the first year we actually are starting to work on marketing, but up to now we have done everything organically. It's just people find us either from other happy students or they found us on one of these big platforms like Udemy or LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the subjects that you like to, to talk about is uh, digital disruption. And that's something that I um, started doing a little research on as well once you mentioned it. Can you break that down for us, what it is and uh, how it is going to affect our, our future? Oh yeah, digital disruption is huge. If you look back over the last 10 years, uh, most of our big companies we have now are the result of a digital disruption. Uh, when we talk about digital disruption, we're really talking about disruption at one of three levels. You either have an ecosystem level, which is basically the whole world and the whole way that things are done. You have it at the industry or market level. Uh, so if you think about, for instance, Uber with taxi cabs, um, that is an industry that they have digitally disrupted by changing the way people get ride sharing instead of calling a taxi cab. And then you have organizational, which is you know, usually your own organization. Um, and when you do the digital disruption, it can either come from the bottom up or it can come from the top down. Um, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Uh, my industry as a, an IT training organization, uh, we teach a certification path called IDLE, which is the, um, it's all about IT service management. How do you run a help desk? How do you run a large organization? And how do you make sure all these services work for your customers. It's on the IT operations side as opposed to the cybersecurity side. And in that realm, uh, if you're gonna teach those classes, you have to become what's known as an authorized training organization. So you have to apply for this, you have to pay money for it, uh, all your courses have to go through scrutiny. And the majority of the ATOs are in-person training organizations. So instead of going to college for four years, you can go to an ATO and you might go there for two or three weeks, you'll get a couple of certifications and then you can go get a job. Um, and generally their business model is, you know, you pay $3,000 for a week of training and you might do two or three weeks. So it might cost you $10,000 for that month. 
and you will um, have an instructor in a classroom setting going through with you and probably five or 10 other students teaching you the material and you'll go take the exam and get certified at the end. Um, we are kind of a unique ATO. We're one of the few that's like digitally native. We don't have a classroom that you can come to. Um, all of our courses are online. You do them at your own pace. You go to our website, you buy it there, you can take it as an hour a day or 20 minutes a day or do it all in one day if you felt like it. Um, and so we're just a very different model than what they're used to. And for the last three years as we've worked with them, um, it's, it's caused a lot of bumps in the road for them because they just weren't sure how to deal with a company like us because we are just so different than everything else that they're used to. Well, fast forward to 2020, March, April, 2020, what happened? COVID, right? And everything changed. That was an ecosystem disruption because of COVID, all of those ATOs, which are based in, in, uh, in the UK, in Europe, even in the US, had to shut down because they couldn't teach in class. You couldn't have 20 people in a classroom anymore. And so they all are now trying to have the disruption to their own organization of switching digital and doing things like live streams through Zoom, uh, trying to do things where it's some other way where they can do it remotely and still have income coming in. The reason I bring up that example is for us, it was zero change because we were already digitally native. We had already gone through that digital disruption in 2018 when we started training those programs to begin with because we built our business around being digitally different. And the interesting thing is a lot of those traditional ATOs don't like us uh, and have it for a couple of years and kept trying to get our business model shut down with the big ATO approver because they're saying, well, it's not fair that Dion Training can do it this way because when they look at the numbers, we were training you know, five, 10,000 students a year. They can train 500 a year because they have a physical classroom limitation. And so they didn't like the fact that we could sell our courses so much cheaper than them that course they're selling for $3,000 for a week, we are selling for $300 because I can scale it because I record it once and sell it you know, 10,000 times. Uh, whereas for them, every time they, they get that course, they have to have an instructor there. They have to pay for the facilities. They have to pay for advertising, electricity, water, all that kind of stuff. And so when you look at your industry, whatever industry you happen to be in, the digital shift that's happened that allows small companies to have huge scale and impact versus the way traditional things were done is completely different. And that's where we as companies have to look at digital disruption and either how we can embrace it so that it can work for our advantage or how it might affect us if somebody changes it. Another great example of that is, you know, think of podcast versus radio, right? Yeah. Um, anybody can now make their own podcast. Um, if you go back, you know, 40 years ago, we wouldn't have the ability to do this. You couldn't just make your own radio station. But now you can make your own radio station by setting up a podcast essentially, right? Um, and that's another digital disruption that's happened and shifting the market and the viewership from radio into podcast, which now affects their advertising and all the other ways that those businesses have to run. And so understanding the digital disruption that's happening at an ecosystem level or a market level or your organization level is really important. Um, and as you have to shift with it. Yeah, it's actually really interesting because uh, iHeartMedia, for example, was one of the largest radio stations. You know, they had markets in Seattle and LA and all over the nation. And now you look at them and they're promoting their podcast network. And it's amazing to me how the radio station has gone from radio only to now they're doing podcasts themselves. Another one is the, um, you know, um, the music industry with uh, iTunes and the way oh, yeah. that, that they were, you know, left in behind, not realizing what was happening. And then all of a sudden Apple's here and now their entire industry is completely changed because of one you know, the MP3. So it, it's- Yeah, we went through the way of where you had to have, you know, a good song to get somebody to buy the album. To now you have to have a good album if you want them to buy all the songs. Because otherwise yeah. you just buy the ones you like, right? Um, and then you take a step further, that industry has now been disrupted over the last 10 years by places like Pandora and Spotify and streaming yeah. services. Because now, I don't know about you, but I haven't bought an album in, I don't know, probably five years. I think I've, I've bought a song on iTunes in five years because I have a Pandora subscription and a Spotify subscription and an Amazon Music subscription for you know five bucks a month, I get every I got millions of songs I can choose from. I just tell my little smart device here, play me X song, and it starts playing. I don't have to own it anymore. And so yeah. that's another shift that we've had from ownership into subscription models. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, yeah, and I think there's a, a real point there about you know uh, just being able to kind of go with the flow or being able to adapt to these changes. I think like to your point being able to identify this change that's coming down the pipe, you know, provides opportunity for innovation and, and being on the next level. But I think also understanding that this has just always been the way business is, right? I mean, you know, before 
you know, in pre-electric times, as soon as we had a electricity, that was the game change, right? And as soon as we got combustion engines, the game changed. And then, you know, and so even though now it's this digital transformation, I mean, this has effectively been going on all, 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 or all along. And so I think it's really important that people just start to embrace it because, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the nature of things. Well, it's yeah, also- so one of the things we learned in business school is- we always talk about the S curves, right? And I know Ryan, you said you're, you're going through business school now, so you probably have hit this already. But when you look at things over time, there's these these S curves that happen. So you start out kind of at the bottom, and you start curving to the right. It starts going up, and as it starts going up, it's going to start coming down again. And so what you're trying to do is jump from one S curve to the next, and so you're jumping from innovation to innovation, so you can continue to go up. Because if you ride that all the way up and you ride it back down, then then you're going to have a loss, right? And so Apple did that by bringing out Apple Music. They start seeing, hey, everybody's going subscription. Let's add that to our portfolio so we can jump off this S curve and into the subscription mindset where we get that monthly recurring revenue. And, and so that's one of the things that as we, as you know, business owners, we have to look at what is the trends in industry? Um, are people happy with renting versus buying? Are people happy with subscription services or do they want to own it outright? And different places will have different ways of doing it based on their business model, their operating model. Um, and it's just interesting that as you start looking around the industry to see where are you on this trend uh, as these changes and these new technologies come. And the other side is you don't want to adopt every every different change that comes out because some of them aren't going to be that great, right? Um, one of the ones I, I love looking at is virtual reality, right? Everybody loves virtual reality. I think it's the coolest thing. Um, and we've looked at it several times in our organization of because there's ways you can use virtual reality to do training. Um, and every time I look at it, I'm like, there's so much potential there, but I just don't see it as widespread adoption because most people aren't going to have a VR headset in their house. Um, right. They're just not going to have it. And so... You know, <laughs> For, for a lot of that, it's not ready there yet. Maybe you guys have one. I have one in my in my house, right? I've got one of the yeah. Oculus. Oculus. And no, but it, but it's a great it's house. a great point. Yeah, I mean, but like at the time I bought mine, right? My, mine's a little bit older, and honestly, I don't use it that often. But yeah. mine is a you know an HTC Vive. But like I'm a Mac guy, and you couldn't run VR off Mac, so I had to buy yeah. a PC plus the headgear plus all the stuff. And I happened to be involved enough in technology that for me it was like, okay, well, we'll give it a shot. You know, like I, I recognize the investment. But for your average user, they're not going to jump all those hurdles to be able to you know watch your course and pretend they're in a, a virtual classroom, for example. And so, that's where it comes down to: what is your use case? Does it really make sense? So if we can make software where you actually are doing something like, um, you know, if you're doing the A plus exam and you need to install a RAM or a hard drive and you want to actually do that kind of stuff, or you're a doctor and you're trying to learn about surgery, maybe it has a good place there. But for the 99% of what I teach, what you're going to do in your day job is on a flat panel display. So really you just need a flat panel display. You don't need VR. And so that's why we keep going, eh, not worth the time to invest into it. Right. <laughs> well, and so to that point though, and talking about our S curves, right? I mean, now you're seeing a uh, virtual reality technology get cheaper. You know, now you can buy these Oculus, you know, all in one units for, you know, four or 500 bucks, maybe a little less in some cases, uh, maybe the Google one's a little cheaper, you know, but you can get into these units that now prices, you know, starting to get more in, in reach of, of more people, you know, and then, uh, you know, now you hear news too, like Apple getting ready to come out with their, you know, $3,000 virtual reality headset with dual H 8K monitors and stuff. And I always sort of joke with Apple that, they might not be the first to the game, but they always bring it best, right? But they're not going to invest in it until it's a thing, right? So so when I'm looking at Apple saying, hey, they're going to launch VR in a year, well, okay, that tells me maybe the S-curve is trending upward, right? So maybe now is time to start looking at adoption, whatever that looks like, right? And I think there are some other technologies and, and things like that, that, you know, at least in the VR space, you know, will, you know, make that more doable. And I think if software gets better, and which will come with better computer processing and better, you know, graphics and all that stuff, I think eventually we could get to a point where it is really useful. But I think you're right that we're very early in, in the S so far. Yeah, I think augmented reality has a, a much bigger... Uh, applicability right now, right? Uh, so there, there's actually some AR uses inside of IT operations. Uh, there's a brand Unify that makes routers and switches. And they have an app, and if you take your phone up to your um, switch, and you look over the port, it'll say, you know, port number one, and it'll tell you, oh, this is hooked up to your server down the hall. You go to port number two, and it'll have augmented reality saying, oh, that's hooked up to here. And just by moving your camera over, it actually sees what is it all connected to. And so it has some different unique ways of doing it. Um, but again, I think it's more of a some of the things are really a uh, a solution looking for a problem as opposed to, you know, a, a problem that's getting a solution. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah, that. No, I think that's right. Well, and I think 
especially with VR. I mean, the approach initially was more entertainment driven, I think. And, you know, entertainment is, is great. And maybe that's a piece of it, but I think it's not a serious problem, right? Like we're not, it's not a big challenge we're actually trying to overcome. It's just, you know, this might be one new channel for entertainment, but you know, we can live without our VR headset. So, but, uh, but I think, you know, the other way around, you know, if VR becomes the solution to a serious problem, I mean, like just what you were describing with augmented reality, I mean, if you could walk around your server room with a pair of goggles on that showed all your paths and showed everything in there, you know, it might be kind of a cool application, right? Maybe that's something that would be worth investing in. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting thing, you know, and it is kind of putting the, the hammer before the nail or, or vice versa. Yep. So. Well, Jason, we're almost at that time. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find you and, and reach out and um, maybe take some of your courses? Certainly. Uh, yeah, easiest place to find us is at diontraining.com, D-I-O-N training.com, uh, or our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash Dion Training. Uh, over there, we've got about 20, 30,000 folks, and we're always on there talking and chatting and doing live streams and other things there. So it's a great place to connect and uh, ask any questions you have. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jason. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this call. I know you're calling from the other side of the pond and it's pretty late where you're at. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, also to everybody who listens to this show this week and every week, we're really grateful for that. Please make sure you interact with the show at eggscast.com. Uh, you can email us, contribute to the show, ask questions, make guest recommendations, et cetera, there. And uh, we're really looking forward to some greater community interaction this year. So with that, Jason, thanks so much for, uh, for stopping by and uh, we're thrilled to death to have you. Thanks for having me.